Hi, ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Julian Avoa. Uh, so, today's going to be an interesting topic because I normally don't talk about male issues, but I've gotten a lot of questions about it, and so I thought maybe it would be best to, to discuss the subject and try to incorporate it into issues for, for women. I will uh, be uh, making this an, a YouTube video, and so if you're not able to see it right now, uh, you can go to YouTube. If you have any questions, you can um, feel free to send me uh, questions to drnovoa.nms at gmail.com. Uh, again, it's uh, drnovoa at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any questions, because I know this is kind of a sensitive subject, and so I just wanted to try to make it uh, a little bit more lively. Um, interesting, but uh, uh, appropriate for, as, and professional. So, which subject, which surgery is more appropriate? Virginal size restoration surgery, which will, is a surgery done for women that will change the diameter of the vaginal tissue to the size of a virgin again. And a lot of people say, well, why would you do that? Well, there are a lot of women that would like to be made again about the size of what they were when they before they had children and before they had uh, um, intercourse. And uh, the key to that is that, first of all, I've done well over 500, 600 of these operations. You may have heard from your local gynecologist that you can do um, a laser therapy to make the vagina smaller. Let me try to stress one very important thing. Those gynecologists are the same gynecologists that have a serious issue with cosmetic gynecologists. I'm a cosmetic gynecologist. Yet, when it comes to making money, those gynecologists don't have a problem buying a $75,000 or $100,000 laser for virginal size reduction that doesn't really work. Okay, why? Because you can narrow the vaginal tissue, but if you don't have a base, if you don't have uh, some foundation to hold it against, it's not going to work. Okay, it will bow out back to the size that it was. And unfortunately, there are women paying $5,000, $10,000 for these laser therapies, and they really don't work because it may narrow you down a little bit, but if your levator ani muscles have been stretched out from delivery, from being with a large partner, uh, from being predisposed to that condition, having, again, having large babies, um, if the levator ani muscles have been stretched out, compromised, or torn, it doesn't matter if you're able to narrow down the, the vaginal tissue above it. The vaginal tissue, like the tissue that it's composed of will stretch back out to where it was before. So the key to all of that is to reinforce the levator ani muscles that surround the vagina. And so that does require a surgery. Uh, the reinforcement of the levator ani muscles is a procedure that's generally done under general anesthesia because it is uncomfortable. Uh, it is a procedure that takes approximately two hours and is a modification of the posterior repair or the posterior corporophy with the incorporation of levator, uh, levator plasty, le reinforcement of levator muscles, as well as a perineal plasty, uh, the tissue between the, the vulva and the anus. And at times, if a woman wants a hymenoplasty to recreate the hymen uh, all over again, it is a when you do that, you are basically making the vagina down to one finger insertion. And I do have pictures of this on my website. If you want to go to uh, drnavoa.com and go to the cosmetic section, or I think it might be under the GYN section, you can actually see where we start with uh, patients that have a vaginal opening, which will accommodate four fingers across, basically a hand across, a diameter larger than would be comparable to the size of a Coke hand, and we're able to reduce that patient's vaginal uh, opening to the size of one finger insertion back to the size that that patient was, comparably to the size that she was when before she had any children, before she had intercourse. And that's why it's called virginal size restoration surgery, 
which is a, a distinction from vaginal rejuvenation surgery, which is a more general concept. Um, so how do you figure out, how do you determine whether or not a patient is a good candidate for virginal size uh, restoration surgery? I call it the, the finger test, the, the two finger test. If you're able to place two fingers inside of the vagina and it's a tight fit and it causes no discomfort to the, to the, uh, to the person, to the, to the woman, then there's no surgery that's necessary. And I don't even recommend that surgery be done uh, in a patient such as that. If you're able to place three fingers inside of the vagina straight across and there's no, there's no tension and it causes no pain, that would probably be a patient that would be appropriate candidate if she wanted to. Again, it's an elective procedure. It's just like breast augmentation. It's just like a liposuction. It's just like a tummy tuck. So it's not a necessary procedure, but it's a procedure maybe that you would be interested in having uh, just for your the particular reasons that you decide are important to you. So that's the three finger across. If you have three, if you're able to place three fingers inside a vagina and it doesn't cause any discomfort, uh, that you might be a candidate for virginal size restoration surgery. If you're able to place four fingers across inside of the vagina, uh, you probably uh, have a significant amount of vaginal laxity and the virginal size restoration surgery would probably be an appropriate uh, uh, surgery and possibly also medically indicated because a lot of times when you have that degree of vaginal elasticity, uh, there, you might have problems like for uh, incontinence, uh, urinary incontinence, stress urinary incontinence. So that would be a good reason to go see uh, your gynecologist. Now here's the distinction. There's less than 1% of cosmetic gynecologists as compared to the overall field of gynecology. So even though you go to your gynecologist, your gynecologist may not do this type of surgery. And I would stress that you not go to someone who says that they've done it and they really don't. And the only way you can do that is to shop around and to ask those questions. And like I said, I've done well over between 500 and 600 of these procedures. And again, I have photographs on our website if you're curious of what that looks like, what it looks like. Now, why would there be such a significant amount of laxity related to, um, uh, that would be a description of this condition? Most of the time, it's going to be associated with having uh, uh, vaginal deliveries. And most of the time, it's going to be associated with having babies born above seven and a half pounds. Now, it doesn't mean that it always happens, but in the majority of cases, the larger the baby, the more likely there is to, to, to develop vaginal laxity uh, and or vaginal relaxation. And uh, the larger the, the, the baby, the more likely that you'll have a levator ani muscle tear. Now, you can't see the tear because it's underneath the vagina, the vaginal tissue. Those muscles surround the vagina. Uh, it's just like a tube, the tube, the vagina is a tube. Well, it's flaccid, but it, pretend that it's a tube. And around that tube are the levator ani muscles. And as the tube stretches out, you can tear those muscles without seeing the tear. You can feel the tear because obviously it's uncomfortable when you have a baby, but you may not be able to see the tear. How you de determine whether or not there is lack, uh, a relaxation is to do an exam uh, a few weeks later, postpartum exam, six weeks to eight weeks later, and determine whether or not that's the condition. Now, here is a key thing that I always hear. Always, always, always hear. Well, I had a 10-pound baby, and my husband never complains about vaginal relaxation. Quite frankly, of course he's not going to complain. And I, I mean to say it in an appropriate way. But let's be honest, we know that if you ask us a question that's going to have a negative answer, it's highly unlikely that we're going to give you that negative answer. Do I look beautiful in this dress? Of course you look beautiful in this dress. Do I look fat in this dress? No, you do not look fat in this dress. Um, because you, we want to be sensitive to your feelings, and of course we don't want to be in the doghouse for a week. So it is not generally a subject that's brought up 
on the side of the woman, but also on the side of the man. Because on the side of the man, he doesn't want to give the impression or feel like he's inadequate in size. He doesn't want to talk about the subject either. And so the subject of vaginal relaxation with a proposal of doing surgery to correct it is almost always going to be a taboo subject unless the, unless the couple is willing to be honest and open with one another. Um, and it's also something that is a very gradual change over time. If you're with a partner for 10 years, if there is a degree of vaginal relaxation, it may not happen overnight. It may take a long time to notice that change or not even notice it at all until there is a, a question and you do an empirical evaluation such as with your gynecologist to see whether or not the finger test is actually something that's appropriate. So if you want to, you're, uh, it's a test that can be done at home by a couple the partner uh, can place two fingers in the vagina to start and then see how many fingers you can place in the vagina without it being uncomfortable. Uh, if it's two, you don't need the surgery. If it's three, you may consider it. If it's four, you probably will need it. And maybe there's also a medical condition that may justify having the surgery done. Again, talk to a cosmetic gynecologist rather than a gynecologist because most gynecologists don't do these surgeries or don't know how to do these surgeries, or haven't done enough of them to justify going under uh, and having it done with someone that's done just a few. So that's my discussion on, well, I'm sorry. Well, so what happens afterwards? Well, when you reinforce the levator ani muscles to make them smaller, small enough to accommodate only a one finger insertion, you basically have recreated the vaginal, the vaginal uh, opening, and also you recreated the outside, the vulva, because uh, the vulva also needs to be made smaller to accommodate the appearance of the vagina. You don't want to have a very large opening. You got to make that opening smaller as well. So you're going to modify the outside of the uh, of the appearance, the vulva, and as well as the inside of the appearance of the vagina. And I often say that it is a gift. That you can only give twice. The first time you uh, you share your virginity with someone, uh, you, you're obviously most of us is going to be much younger. Sometimes it's going to be uh, a bad choice. Sometimes it's going to be a great choice. But it is a choice that's based on um, not a lot of experience because it's your first time. But the second time around, it is a gift that's exceptionally special because it's going to be given to someone or shared with someone where you have had a great deal of personal, emotional experience. And generally the age uh, for someone that's going to have the surgery done is between 35 and 50 years of age. So that second person is going to be someone that's really, really important or should be very, very important to you. Mind you, like I always tell patients related to getting breast augmentation, uh, done. If your ex finds out that you've had virginal size restoration surgery, that person is probably going to be knocking on the door, joking around because they're very, very interested in this particular situation. They're, they're right there. So be very careful uh, with who you choose because it is a very important gift to share with someone. So that's my, my commentary on virginal size restoration surgery. So how does virginal size restoration surgery have an association with uh, penis enlargement or uh, penile enlargement? Very important because I get a lot of patients that come in and they're saying my husband or my boyfriend complains that I'm too loose. And I hate to be derogatory about it, but I'm just sharing exactly how I generally get the comment. And the first thing that I say, well, let's go ahead and do an examination. And when I examine a patient and she's two uh, fingers to three fingers across and she's got good Kegel uh, exercise potential or she's got good levator ani muscle contraction, I tell her, you probably don't need this surgery. So now we got to focus in on the partner. And let's just be kind of frank about this. Um, 
and I'm going to have some props. So for all you guys out there, because I know this is this video was supposed to be for guys, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to go get your tape measure. Okay, we're not going to be measuring anything anatomically, but I wanted everybody to get a tape measure because I want you to be able to measure some things to get a comparison. And because I can throw numbers at you, but visually it's important to get an idea of what we're looking at. So let's talk about what the average male uh, length and girth is or circumference. We're going to call, we're going to say girth, uh, which is the co most common way to describe it. So I did a lot of research so that I could give you information. And I really, really think that if you have the time, I put the link up so that you could go to the uh, British Journal of Urology International. And it's a great, a great article. Uh, a lot of numbers were thrown at you. And they did a reference to another article uh, with where they actually asked women uh, for a research project. And that was at the um, Pelos 1 article and it's also you get if you double click on that in the in the journal article that I gave you you can find this particular article so according to the British Journal of Urology International which did an evaluation of over 17 uh, papers that were that were published they covering around 15,000 men the these are the calculations number one the average length of the flaccid or non-erect penis is going to be 3.61 inches long. So if you want to get your tape measures, 3. Uh, sorry, 3.61. I think I was a dyslexic there, but 3.61 inches long when flaccid and 5.16 inches long when erect. So the closest thing that I could come up with was one of our urine pregnancy test little tubes. So this around is 3.75, 3.75 around, and it is four long. So this is a little bit uh, wider and a little bit longer than the flaccid penis of the average male. Here's where we get into an interesting situation, however. If I were to place two fingers across, this is just a little bit smaller than two fingers across. So if a woman has had children and she has, has some vaginal relaxation, but still within normal, a male who went erect only becomes uh, a little bit less than four and a half, four and a half, that's four and a half on a diameter, that's less than two fingers. So you might notice some changes with after having had a baby, but still you might be totally normal. And if you're totally normal, there's nothing wrong with you. It has to do now with your partner. And men are exceptionally sensitive about their penises. Exceptionally sensitive. And it's the butt of everybody's jokes. If you happen to share that information at a party, oh my God, it's like you just dropped a major bomb in there because... Uh, the, Nobody's going to ever forget that you said that your boyfriend has a small penis. That's just something that's going to be come up at every subject and every party, every party. So if there's nothing wrong with you or doing a major surgery to modify your vaginal size, what is a better alternative to that? Probably it's going to be penile enlargement without a surgical option for the male or a, a very minor surgical option for the male as opposed to going through major surgery for vaginal uh, virginal size restoration surgery for the female partner but that's the key here most of the time when i see patients they come in and they have they're saying that their boyfriends are complaining about the size that they're too loose it's not the woman it's the male it's the men. 
that have an issue and they're blaming their partners and they're really making them feel uncomfortable. It is something I have had uh, women come into my office who are literally crying because they're saying that their boyfriend, and I said, listen, that's how he's getting to you. If it's your ex-boyfriend, that's how he's getting to you. And there's nothing wrong with you. I don't recommend surgery. There's something, it's him. Okay. So however you want to take that, uh, you can keep it as a, as a personal comment uh, or you can share it with everybody that you want to share it with. It's not you. It happens to be your partner. So that's the key related to uh, virginal size restoration surgery. So let's talk about the male partner. So the male partner, when erect, I got my tape measure out again. So I'm trying to try to figure out whether or not this is actually an appropriate size. I'm going to show you in a moment. Just give me a moment because I don't have these these props. So I don't have um, penis props in the office. Okay, so um, this seems to be slightly uh, shorter. And no, this is about right. This little can of uh, very sexy platinum for him. I think it's a body spray. My, my wife got it for me. So when erect, the male penis is slightly smaller in diameter than this. But look, two fingers, two fingers. This is still normal and uh, a little bit longer than five uh, and, and, a, and a tenth, 5.1 inches long. So this is the normal length of an erect penis by their calculations. So what can penis enlargement surgery do and what types of penis enlargement surgery are there? Uh, let's, let's talk about the more aggressive types of surgery because it's not really meant for, um, uh, for what I'm talking about uh, and generally only done by uh, cosmetic surgery is very specialized or urologists that are very specialized in these types of surgery. Uh, surgeries that can be done fully conscious in the office setting can increase the girth or the circumference of a penis by simple fat transfer. If in, Think of it in this way. If you like the Brazilian butt lift where you're moving a lot of fat from the abdomen to the buttocks, Fat transfer to the penis is just a small amount of fat that's taken and you inject it underneath the, uh, the, uh, the skin and, the, uh, and um, in the uh, fascia layer of the shaft of the penis. Uh, you don't inject it in the, in the, um, in the glands, uh, but if you can inject it there and the procedure can be done fully awake, it can increase the diameter, excuse me, the circumference or the girth of the penis. It does not change the length of the penis. If you want to try to change the length of the penis, you're going to have to cut the suspensatory ligament uh, that's uh, just above the penis. And that can be kind of tricky because then you have to use an extender for a while. Uh, and um, it, it, you can run into some issues with nerve damage and it may not even work uh, if you're not following the protocols to make sure that it stays extended for a period of time. Uh, but what you can do is you can use fat transfer to the penis to increase the girth or you can use cosmetic fillers to inject into the shaft of the penis to increase the girth. Now, the best product that I've seen for uh, volume in, uh, enhancement of the girth of the male penis is going to be the uh, Allergan Voluma. Uh, Allergan Voluma is a heavy uh, viscosity uh, hyaluronic acid filler. Uh, it is, works very, very well with volume enhancement, but it is very expensive compared to the other fillers such as Juvederm, where you would enhance your lips with the use of Juvederm, which you can also enhance with uh, uh, Voluma, although Voluma is off-label for uh, enhancement of the lips. And if you really want some power lips, like the Kardashians, then you might want to put Voluma in your lips. Uh, but if you want to do it for the penis, then Voluma is, an, is a very, 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 very good product 
to inject into the shaft of the penis. I mean, uh, underneath the skin, not directly into the, uh, the spongy tissue to enhance its size. Now, how much of a change can you get out of that? Let's suppose that this is an erect, the erect diameter of a male penis when fully erect. Remember, this is what it looks like when it's not erect. This is the diameter when it is erect. In one session with the use of between eight and 10 fillers, this is the diameter when it's not erect. This is erect, natural state. Put voluma in your penis and it's not erect and that is the circumference. Six inches of circumference. So here's where we got with the guys. Take a tape measure. Uh, put six inches across and make a circle. Make a circle. That is six inches of diameter size that you can increase the diameter of the shaft of the penis in the non-erect diameter to the non-erect diameter with the use of uh, Voluma. That's an incredible enhancement in diameter size. Now, the number of fillers that you need is dependent on the length of the penis. On average, if the length of the penis is between 3.5 inches and 4 inches in a flaccid state, anywhere between 8 and 10 fillers will do it. The problem is the cost. Each filler costs uh, approximately $500. So you're looking at investing about $5,000 if you want to do it with a Voluma filler. If you want to do it as a fat transfer, uh, you're going to look at probably filling up rather than 10 milliliters, excuse me, uh, yes, 10 milliliters of Voluma, you're going to need somewhere between 20 and 25 milliliters of fat to put that into the penis. And why so much? Number one, the fat is spongy, so it gives a lot. Number two, you're going to lose half of the fat in the transfer. Half of the fat is going to be lost in the transfer. Just like when you do the um, uh, Brazilian butt lift. If you're going to do a Brazilian butt lift, you're going to need to put in twice the amount of fat into the buttocks as you're expecting it to, to slim down in size. Because just like moving a plant from one plant planter to another, sometimes you're going to lose the plant and moving it from one planter to another because the plant will die, it has to take root, and that's what will happen with uh, fat transfer to both the buttocks and also to the penis. So you're going to need somewhere between 20 and 25 milliliters of good fat uh, and move that. And generally, where do you get the fat from? You're going to get it from the, from the abdomen for men uh, and or the sides and the hips and the little uh, um, uh, muffin top that men get too. Uh, or some area that's very, very soft tissue, not from the back, not from the shoulders, usually from the abdomen. Um, and that's where you get the fat from. You process it, you inject it into the, into the uh, penis. And generally speaking, again, you can do these procedures fully awake. You just do a, 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 a dorsal penile block to numb the penis. And once you're underneath the skin, uh, a microcatheter can slide back and forth without it being uncomfortable at all. So this is really, really uh, good for most guys that are worried about, hey, what's going on there? You know, you're down messing with my stuff. Uh, it's not really uncomfortable. Even the, the original needles that you need to just to numb the spot to create your little porthole uh, is, is, not, is relatively not uncomfortable for men. Uh, so again, why is this so important? Because I keep watching, I keep seeing these infomercials I read on the internet because this stuff keeps pop, pop, popping up about taking pills or uh, putting creams on. This stuff doesn't work. Guys, these, these things do not work to enlarge your penis. Okay, stop buying the pills. Even though they're sent into you for free, you just have to pay for the shipping and handling, whatever. It's a waste of time. And there's not a single pill, not a single cream that you can apply to increase the diameter of your penis uh, uh, almost immediately from, from this size to this size. Again, uh, a, a flaccid, and to this side, flaccid. Okay, now, 
this is actually three fingers across. This is why, because most men do not have a six uh, inch circumference or girth penis. And this is why we talk for women. Maybe you could consider uh, vaginal, uh, virginal size restoration surgery simply because if you're able to accommodate this and you're noticing a level of relaxation uh, and your Kegel exercises aren't working because your levator any muscles are torn or you're just completely relaxed, uh, that's probably why. That's where we're coming up with the two fingers, three fingers, and four fingers. Uh, four fingers, if you take a Coke can, you can see the four fingers across and that's how that works. So, what is the benefit or the differences between Voluma and fat transfer? Number one, fat transfer is totally natural. It comes from your own fat. You can also use PRP or uh, platelet-rich plasma, which you inject around the tissue so that the f uh, fat will take better, uh, which uh, is, a, is a good, pro uh, a good um, technique to use as well. You, can, um, you have to filter the fat very well, and you have to be careful not to get an infection. You have to clean off very well. The only issues that we have really for fat is that it can it can be lumpy sometimes. You have to be make sure you're processing it very very well so that you don't have any, any irregularities in the um, in the tissue below the skin. You don't want to have a huge bump in one spot and completely indented in the other. I mean you got to smooth it all out, and that's relatively easy to avoid. But it does happen, and that's a potential uh, issue complication. Uh, that procedure costs. Uh, approximately three thousand dollars to do so still a little bit on the expensive side for most what what most guys want to spend uh, but it 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 is less expensive than a voluma treatment and the voluma treatments are eight to ten uh, uh, syringes uh, five five hundred dollars a syringe four thousand dollars to five thousand uh, uh, dollars for total treatment what I've seen is that although fat transfer is an excellent procedure. The tissue is relatively soft and spongy and it doesn't have the volume appearance when in a flaccid state as the Voluma does. The Voluma is a standout. It is a firmer uh, uh, hyaluronic acid and it keeps its volume. So the, the, the girth of the penis is in, in, in very, very impressive when you've taken eight to 10 syringes and the tissue tends to be a little bit firmer. So even when you're, you're walking around, the penis has the appearance almost of a, of a mild, erect stature. I mean, it's not pointing straight out. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there's a lot of volume there. You're really filling up those cuffs, those uh, jock straps. And um, it, it's, it's something that you cannot not see when you're in the locker room and the guy's locker room there's a definite difference that you're you're out there walking around um that's rather impressive so that's the the issue that we're talking about with using voluma as compared to a fat transfer uh fat transfers can be repeated volumas can be repeated how long do they last fat transfer once you lose the 50 percent of the fat is expected to um to last forever and as a matter of fact, is that you gain weight, your, your penis also gets larger because there's fat there and they, it also takes up some of the cells. So you get one of those. With Voluma, the, uh, the expected time period is going to be two years. There are plenty of guys that have the, the, uh, Voluma or, or even women that use Voluma and they last a lot longer than two years, some extending way past three to four years. Uh, and so that that's a, a benefit there. So as cost effective, yes, uh, fat transfer is less expensive. Um, and but the overall appearance is not as volum uh, not as much volume as an equivalent amount of Voluma. Uh, it doesn't have the firmness that uh, the Voluma gives you. And uh, but it's less expensive there. The risk factors with Voluma are minimal. Uh, for, as long as you clean off the penis properly, there's a very, very little risk of infection, very, very little risk of allergic reaction to the Voluma. Uh, it is a synthetic product. Um, and so it is, is well worth the money if you can afford it. So with the guys trying to figure out, well, is it worth it? Well, just remember that every time you go out to dinner, every time you go out to the movies, you're going to be spending 
about a hundred to two hundred dollars a night just try to calculate that into whether or not an investment of four to five thousand dollars is really worth it for you are already worth it for the couple um, and guys are spending money on cosmetic uh, procedures all the time just like women women are getting breast augmentations guys are getting liposuction of their breast women are getting uh, liposuctions of their abdomen so are guys uh, uh, only in the um, uh, the transgenders do, do we see that I see where uh, 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 there's there's a, a lot more of cosmetic procedures being done but in general bo uh, both of the sexes are spending a lot of money uh, and time and effort on cosmetic procedures now unlike the virginal size restoration surgery uh, penal enlargement can be done awake minimal risks and although I consider it to be a surgery, some doctors don't because the fact is all you're using is a needle insertion uh, and a little bit of lipo. lipo liposuction is a surgery, um, but for Voluma itself as a, as a filler, there are plenty of doctors that don't feel that a, a filler is, a placing a filler is actually surgery. So that's the key there. A couple final things that I wanted to talk about for guys is uh, number one, the level of testosterone starts to go down in men after the age of 35. So even though they want to maintain uh, an erection for a longer period of time, uh, you generally start to notice that there are changes in levels of strength and masculine appearance, masculine effect, starting at the age of 35. And that seems to get more progressively uh, affected as you get older. So, and that's absolutely true. As far as men are concerned, their uh, erections and their flaccid state of their penises also get shorter uh, and, and more narrow of approximately half an inch uh, as you get older. Uh, and that does affect men in a, uh, uh, in, a, in a significant way many times. And so that's another consideration. Uh, the management for low testosterone or low T, you've probably seen in commercials, is to get injections of testosterone. We do those type of... Uh, treatments in the office as well for males we get baseline labs to find out what their baseline testosterone lives and then we probably to put them in a super uh, physiologic state now this is not like and uh, uh, the use of uh, anabolic steroids okay uh, it is legal as long as you're being followed by a doctor and you're not using it to try to do it you're trying to match a low T state to trying to improve a low T state and not giving testosterone as an allobotic steroid for men that are trying to weight lift. As a matter of fact, if you give too much testosterone to a male, their 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 tes testicles shrink up, their penises get shorter, they're not able to maintain erections. So it's actually a worsening effect. But a male can get uh, on average 200 milligrams of testosterone weekly as a subcut uh, subcutaneous injection, uh, and it's pretty easy to give. And those injections improve the testosterone level, improve endurance, slimmer fit, stronger erections, uh, and uh, that, that's a benefit there. The also uh, use of um, over-the-counter over the products like um, um, maca, which is a, uh, a, a plant that's available in, in my, my home country of Peru, maca can help significantly increase the amount of uh, semen production from what we've seen in the uh, in some of the um, uh, publications. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. You can get it from Puritan Pride. Uh, very good product. Uh, very low in price, uh, but you can also get it um, uh, obviously at the GNC store. So that's uh, one of the last points I wanted to say related to this. We're trying to build up the guys to be able to 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 perform like they did when they were in their twenties. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is the use of uh, Viagra. Viagra came off uh, off um, uh, the uh, patent was uh, expired, and now Viagra in the generic form is available for only a dollar a tablet. So you can use your uh, good RX pr uh, prescription privileges and get uh, the generic form of Viagra for a dollar a tablet at many of the stores that, that, that uh, in, in the pharmacies. So the combination of testosterone injections, generic Viagra, uh, the use of maca, 
uh, and of course, good diet, good exercise, and um, and if you want the in, penal enlargement uh, treatments with fat transfer versus Voluma, all are of a benefit. One last thing is the natural appearance uh, of how much fat you have around the penis is very important. If you're going to get liposuction done to get some of the good fat so that you can do a fat transfer, it is recommended that you do liposuction of the pubic area as well because men as they gain weight, there's going to be a little bit of a bulge in that area and that offsets the appearance the, the appearance of the length of the penis or it makes the penis look kind of smaller because you have a mound of fat in that general area. So optical illusion or however you want to call it, I recommend that men that are trying to enhance the appearance of their penis to do liposuction just above in the pubic area to flatten that down and make uh, the overall area uh, uh, smaller so that the penis looks larger. So I hope I've answered some questions. My main goal was to not make women think that they have to have virginal size restoration surgery as the only option and uh, for uh, enhancement of sexual response. Uh, it's really important to understand that uh, in many cases it is the male that should be having uh, treatments done or, tr uh, or some type of management. And there is a variety of, of options available to males now, whether or not it's fat transfer, whether or not it's Voluma, whether or not it's Viagra, uh, maca and um, of course diet exercise and um, and of course try to manage any underlying conditions such as diabetes or uh, hypothyroidism for example these are uh, keyly important also uh, what what benefit did I see or what we read through the studies because I did read the study very interesting is uh, well why would uh, why would it be important to try to enlarge the size of the penis? Well, the study that was quoted uh, did um, had 75 women that uh, looked at pictures, three-dimensional pictures, and they were doing it as if they, it was a one-night stand, interestingly enough, a one-night stand as compared to uh, a long-term relationship. And... What they found was that the women that were looking at the pictures and were look and considering only a one night stand preferred a penis size of 6.4 inches long by five inches in circumference. So they're looking at something exactly this size, but this is not the average size of the male penis. As I said before, in the erect state, the average penis is 5.16 with a girth of 4.59. So we're already behind the eight ball there. So, uh, and for long-term relationships, it was just a 0.1 centimeter off by, by almost both of them, the length as well as the girth. So why is that important? Well, um, it seems to suggest that women are settling. In the majority of cases, women are settling that girth appears to be more important. Uh, uh, it is important. And if you don't have the diameter, you don't have the girth, uh, guys need to consider uh, maybe modifying that and changing that. So it's, I've heard women say it all the time, it's not the length of the penis, it's how the girth of the penis. And of course, yes, it's not, it's not the, uh, what do they say? Uh, um, it's not the size of the, uh, the, uh, the robe, but how you use it. Of course, it's important that, that men be uh, good lovers, but the fact of the matter is that you have to have the proper equipment of the proper size or you're never going to get anywhere. So uh, that's, that's my uh, spiel on this particular subject. I hope that I've given you some good pointers as to where to go. I hope that you'll uh, double click on the link for the particular study of the British Journal of Urology International. It's an excellent uh, 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 study that I, I was, I read through and I was, what's it? I said at the end, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, and the 75 uh, woman study, this thing is 13 pages long. I may fall asleep just reading it, but uh, I, I, it's, <laughs> it's amazing how a study about sexuality could put you to sleep. Uh, that's, I, but I'm going to read it to see if I can learn anything more. 
So, uh, I hope that I've answered your questions. Uh, please, uh, if anybody has any more questions, because I know it's a sensitive subject, please feel free to contact me at drnovoa.nms at gmail.com. And um, especially for the guys, because I know it's a very sensitive subject, we'd be glad to answer your questions. And um, next time, I, I hope to be able to give you an update on the other subjects we always talk about, post-tubal ligation syndrome, uh, cesarean sections, VBACs. Uh, if you have some more questions, another I want to go over the topic again for, um, for this particular subject. Oh, uh, one last part, because we, we, get, we do get questions about this all the time, is that why would girth be an important uh, question? Why would it be girth be important to be slightly larger than average? Well, it appears that the girth seems to stimulate the U spot and the G spot um, mm -hmm. as inside of the vagina. And so that's why we as cosmetic surgeons inject the, uh, the G spot to make it slightly larger for pressure against the penis for stimulation and for more intense orgasms. The length of the penis uh, may affect the A spot and the P spot. Now, if you don't, if that's not making any sense, we're talking about the major erogenous zones of the vagina and the clitoris. The clitoris, the U spot, is right around the urethra. The um, the G spot, about two inches in on the on the upper portion of the vagina. The uh, A spot, all the way to the back, in front of the uh, just in front of the uh, cervix. The P spot. Uh, behind the cervix all the way to the back, uh, be, um, underneath and behind the cervix, cervix. So that's another subject. We have already covered that. If you want, go to YouTube. Uh, Danielle and I did a really good, pre I thought we did a very good presentation on the erogenous zones, including the clitoris. And um, they're also very, very um, uh, Im important as far as multiple stimulations from multiple techniques for something called sustained orgasmic stimulation, which is a, a continuous orgasm that is so intense that the patient actually may faint from the stimulation. Um, that's, that's an impressive situation as well. So why girth may be important is the stimulation of the U as well as the G spot. Again, it's girth for length. It would be the A and the P spot. So anyway, I hope that this has been informative. Feel free to contact us at uh, contact me at drnovoa.nms at gmail.com. If you have any other questions, thank you for listening. Have a great weekend. Bye.